So we're going to turn into the book of Judges tonight, chapter number 16 and verse number 15 is where we're going to start. And you're going to recognize right away that this is a story that most all of you are going to uh, be well acquainted with. But I've had something on my mind for a little bit, and God's been kind of churning that thing in the background in my heart. And in the time in the time I've been preaching and pastoring, I have preached about just about every subject you can think of. And it didn't dawn on me till today that I, I don't think, I, I looked, I couldn't find anything. I don't know of any message that I have ever preached an entire message about this subject. I want to talk to you tonight uh, about the pain of betrayal. Uh, how many of you tonight has ever been betrayed before by somebody that you really love, somebody close to you? Anybody ever been betrayed and um, I, I, would, I would go as far as to say probably the most painful thing that you can experience, one of the most painful human emotions is the, the emotion or the feeling of being betrayed by someone that's really close to you, someone you really think highly of, someone that you love. That is one of the most painful things that you can uh, think of. One of the things that came to my mind Today I'm going to get into a lot of different stuff, but as I was sitting contemplating a lot of this today, I remember being a young, a young child, and I don't tell very many people this, just like there's things probably about your life you may not share with a lot of people, but for whatever reason, I think uh, according to counselors, they say that as a young child, I went through so much, living with this family for a while, living with that family a while, and just a lot of the other inter- ongoings in my childhood, they say that that was a big product of it, but for many years of my childhood, I was what they call a bed of wetter. I don't know if any of you ever know anybody like that, but it was something as a child that I was really self-conscious about. I hated the idea of going and staying the night with my friends because I was always afraid I was going to wet the bed. And so being that conscience about it, it was something that I didn't really want anybody else to know. And... There were very, very few people in my inner circle except for people that were in my immediate family that knew about it. And I had a close friend of mine that I remember sharing with that I had this problem. Well, the, well, the problem with that is is that friendships come and go. And unfortunately, when friendships come and when they go, a lot of times people will use the things that they, they know can hurt you or damage you or destroy you against you. And uh, I'll never forget being a young child and having one of my friends go to school and tell all kind of people that I wet the bed. It was humiliating. And as a child, one of the things that uh, I, I answered everything, all of my problems, I answered them with physical violence. I got suspended and expelled so many times as a kid, it's not even funny. I was on the bus one time, headed back from, uh, we, I lived in Howie in the Hills, And I had these two brothers, and no, I didn't shave my head because we got lice, but I had these two brothers in our school that they they both got uh, lice, so their mom shaved their head. Well, we were riding along, and they kept making fun of me about something, and I'm like, "Uh, where are you to come up with that? You know, your mom shaved your head because you had lice, you know. And so these two brothers thought they were going to attack me, so one of them, started insinuating he was going to get up and run over there well when I was a little kid I wore cowboy boots all the time little pointed toe cowboy boots and I jumped over the seat and started kicking the daylights out of these two boys I ended up uh, hurting both those boys really bad I got expelled off the bus my mom had to take me to school so as a child I dealt with a lot of childhood emotional trauma and things and I can tell you that um, I experienced betrayal at a very young age in many capacities and so many stories I could tell you but how many can somewhat relate to what I just shared anybody's ever been through or in something and you know that that is so incredibly painful and that's the subject I want to talk about tonight is the pain of betrayal and I don't know maybe you've recently gone through something or maybe it's something that you went through years ago but you still grapple with the pain of it now 
Maybe it's caused a lot of trust issues and you have a hard time trusting people and you, and you feel like you're kind of boxed in a shell and you just wall yourself in and anytime people try to get close to you, you push people away. Or maybe you're going to go through something in the near future and God's just trying to help you in what you're about to deal with. So I don't know, but I do know God dealt with me about this, so I want to talk to you about it. So John, uh, Judges, I mean, chapter 16 and verse 15, if you got it, say amen. And by the way, thank you for being here tonight. I want to continue to see this you know, crowd of folks grow. But this right here is an opportunity to disciple you in these lessons in a way that I, it's hard to do whenever I'm in fifth gear preaching a lot of times. Don't forget about our uh, fall uh, festivities we're going to be having coming up soon. That's going to be on November the 4th. So please make sure. Uh, yeah, don't, don't forget about that. And, and please do remember to invite and talk to other people about coming. Anybody notice that it feels real nice in here? I know the weather's good outside, but I can literally feel the air blowing way over here. Never could do that before. Isn't that awesome? Judges chapter 16, verse 15, and this is what the Bible said. And she said unto him, this is talking about Delilah and Samson, by the way, and she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words, isn't that the way the devil works? When she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death. You know what she was doing? She was driving him crazy. That he told her all his heart, and said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart, then the lords of the Philistines came up upon her and brought money in their hand. Some people miss this, but she was paid off by the Philistines to betray Samson. She made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. She said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson, and he awoke out of his sleep, and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him, for the Spirit of the Lord had departed. To me, that's one of the most concerning scriptures I have read in the New Testament, because here's a person that is so used to God's anointing and his presence and power being there, and he played the fool with God and one day shook himself and the power was gone. That's a pretty scary place to be with God. But listen to what the Bible said. But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. You may have heard me say this before, but in research in the past, I found that this grinding mill that they talked about in the Bible, this in itself was a thing of humiliation, because back in this time frame, the Philistines' grinding mill was one that was typical of a slave woman uh, grinding. And so here is a position. It would have been a humiliating thing for Samson as a man, as a male champion of Israel, to have his eyes gouged out and grinding at a prison mill, which would typically be the job of slave women. So it was one of the greatest uh, humiliations that they could bring upon him and they did this for sport during a great uh, festivity and celebration where the, the whole nation had come together for the celebration and they're watching and seeing him when they bring him out for sport later on you remember that so what I want to talk to you tonight is a couple different I want to call them lesson objectives a couple things that I want to make sure that we discuss and the first is to better understand uh, betrayal in itself and hopefully uh, have some methodology or some methods of how to deal with betrayal. Secondly, to better understand the pain 
that comes from it, pain that is caused from betrayal, and third, to ensure that you and I don't become guilty of betrayal or to become a betrayer. Because if we can see how much damage that it causes and how it starts, I feel like that it will help us to realize that it's not a safe and it's not a fair thing to become a betrayer of those that love and trust us. You agree? So those are the three things I want to talk about. And at the end of our lesson tonight, here's what I want to forewarn you or let you know in advance. At the end of our lesson tonight, I'm going to open up the floor to give you an opportunity to share some personal instances or stories of maybe where someone has betrayed you or maybe even where you yourself have been guilty of the very same thing. So let's take a moment tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer. I want the Lord to uh, bless the Word of God in such a way that it is palatable. I want you to be able to understand it and digest it. And you pray for me as well. I've had a bad headache throughout the day, so the Lord will touch me in body so I can deliver this in, with clarity of thought tonight. So let's have a word of prayer tonight, if you will. If you will, uh, pray with me. Father, tonight we're just thankful for the Word of God, for the Spirit of God that is in this place. We pray, God, that you'll touch everything that is said and done tonight, that the church will be edified and you will be glorified in everything that is said and done. The people that end up listening online are blessed as well, and we'll give you all the praise and glory and honor for all that is accomplished in Jesus' name, and everyone can say amen. Amen. So even though most all of us are going to say, hey, I'm familiar with the text, the story of Samson and Delilah, and him laying his head into the lap of a deceptive woman, and all of this, I want to just walk through the story, walk through the text quickly, and hit some of the highlights in case maybe you don't remember it, or maybe you've never heard it, or maybe you just are not as familiar with it as maybe you'd like to be. First of all, I want you to see that Samson is a natural man with supernatural strength. He is just like you and me. A lot of times uh, when we think of the story of Samson and we've seen pictures, anybody ever seen pictures of what people depict as what they think Samson would look like? He looks like he belongs in like Gold's Gym or something. He's got all these huge bulging biceps and his legs look like he's never missed a leg day. You know what I mean? He's, he's a big, big man. But in my mind, the more I've studied, the more I've prayed, the more I've uh, thought about the story of Samson, I don't believe that that was the way Samson looked. Because here's what I believe. I believe that if Samson would have came in looking like the rock or even bigger, I think if he would have come in looking like some giant of a man, God would not have received as much glory and it would have been a little strange. I'm not saying he wasn't a muscular guy. I just don't see him being some muscle-bound dude walking in looking like he could bench press you know, 10,000 pounds or something. I just don't see Samson that way. I see Samson as being a natural, ordinary man that God would give supernatural power, that people would be in awe. They're like, how in the world is that guy able to do that? They couldn't, they couldn't give his muscle credit. They couldn't give his physique credit. They had to give God credit because where else could strength like that come from? Anyone else see exactly what I'm saying? But the strength that God had given Samson was for a reason. God tells us in His Word who He calls, He equips. If God's called you to be a Sunday school teacher, I believe He will equip you. I believe if God's called you to be a pastor, He will equip you. A missionary, He will equip you. If you're to be a prophet or, you know, whatever it is, I believe God will give you whatever it is you need to fulfill the calling that God's put on your life. Some may not realize this, but Samson had a calling in and on his life, in his mother's womb, from before his birth. And that was to be, uh, he was to be an an instigator of sorts and to uh, tear up the enemy's plot and plan, which was the Philistine people. He was to uh, bring havoc or wreak havoc on the Philistine nation for the justification uh, of the Israelite people. He was to be the champion of Israel, if you will. And in doing so, God would be glorified. He was to... Uh, stir up their their initiative and cause problems for the Philistine people in many different ways. So the strength of Samson, when we when we look at it, we can see that he he was given a mission. He was given strength for a purpose. But unfortunately, if you read through the story of Samson, you will see that Samson used and Samson abused the power that God put on his life. 
How many of you believe that you can be anointed and use it for the wrong reasons? You can use it for personal gain. And we see that in the story of Samson. Many of the things you see that Samson did had very little to nothing to do with the reason that God gave him that power. Many times he used it for his selfish purposes. But his supernatural strength was tied to a secret covenant which was between him and God. If you know anything about the Nazarite vow, there are certain vows that they made between them and God. And one of, that, one of the Nazarite vows was that they would not cut their hair. And so the reason that this is seen in many different cultural ways as a, uh, as a sign of, I would guess you would say, a sacrifice was because it was seen to be feminine for a man to have long hair. And so when we look at it from the cultural context, we understand this is a sacrifice that they would make as that they would appear uh, feminine in the eyes of their cultural brothers and sisters. So they would do this as a covenant between them and God. God, I'm not going to cut my hair. I'm not going to take fruit of the vine (coughs) because that way that no one could say, Uh, that they were drunk or that they had anything to do with alcohol because the fruit of the vine. They weren't to be around any dead thing. There were just certain vows they made between them and God. One of the things about the Nazarite, there were some people that were born a Nazarite. It was a lifetime vow that they made between them and God. And then there were people that were Nazarites for seasons. In other words, they would take a Nazarite vow and it might be for a year. It might be uh, two or three years. But Samson was a man that was born with a Nazarite vow, a vow that was supposed to last the lifetime of his life. And so when we see him, we know that this vow is tied to his hair. And this is what we could call the secret to his strength. This is this vow was a product. It wasn't necessarily that his hair in itself was powerful. It was the vow that he made between him and God that gave him that power. He knew that. God knew that. But Delilah and and Samson's enemies did not know. Samson's enemies knew that he had power. They didn't know why. And they wanted to know why. Why does this man have so much power with God? Why does this man have such supernatural strength that he's able to defeat us and our people? And so what began to happen is the Philistines realized that Samson was a threat to their nation and to their people. And so they started trying to devise a plan to appeal to Samson's greatest weaknesses. Do you know that when you look at men like uh, David, King David, David was a man that was great in battle. He was a great uh, strategic warrior and leader. But Samson, I mean, uh, David, just like Samson, had a weakness. And the enemy wanted to appeal to David. Do you remember King David whenever the Bible, he he slew uh, slew Goliath and here you got people dancing in the street and they're singing this song that Samson uh, or Saul has killed his uh, thousands but David has killed his tens of thousands. That was a song they were singing. They were rallying behind this great King David. How great that he was. But yet a man who they sang songs about how great he was in battle was whooped by his own weakness of the flesh of lust. How many of you know that about David? And here we've got Samson who we're talking about tonight. And his weakness, which the enemy was going to appeal to, was with women. I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but if you ever study much about Samson, you'll know this guy really loved beautiful women. This guy's weakness was was what some men might call some real hot women. And so that was where his weakness was. And the Philistines began to take note of that. Let me say this before I go on tonight. Don't think for one minute the enemy doesn't know where your weaknesses are. You can have ten different strengths and one weakness, and you can guarantee the, the enemy is going to appeal to your weakness. If your weakness is your temperament, and all it takes is some little thing. We were talking about it before church. I know the enemy knows 
that I don't play too well when it comes to my wife and my kids. And when somebody goes messing with my wife and kids, it will stir up the worst in me. Anybody else understand what I'm saying? Mess with my wife, mess with my kids. I don't like that. I've got another weakness I've shared with you before. One great weakness. I've always dealt with this. I've done a lot better, but I still have to work on it. I do not like to be accused of something I did not do. It just stirs me up, makes me makes me really angry. And the enemy knows that. How many of you know tonight the enemy's got your number? Amen. So they conspire with this beautiful Philistine beauty queen. That's what I'm going to call her tonight. They conspire with this hottie from Philistia. And uh, she's going to toy around with Samson until she earns enough of his trust that he will reveal to her his weakness, and guess what's going to happen? She's going to get paid, and Samson's going to lose his power. That's what's going to happen when it's all over with. So Delilah has attempted several times before we start reading in our text tonight. Three different times she has tried to get him to reveal where is the secret. He would tell her something, and the Philistines would run in and come to find out he didn't tell her the truth. So finally she gets irritated and like, you know, you're deceiving me. I thought you trusted me and all this sort of thing. Tell me wherein is your strength, you know, your your strength lie. Well, this is whenever Samson eventually places far too much trust in this deceptive woman and he reveals the secret to his supernatural power. It is this covenant that I have with God and my uncut hair. These seven locks of my hair. And so before it's all said and done, we read in the Bible how that she has these seven locks cut off by the Philistines when he falls asleep in her lap and they run in, cut his hair off, uh, and they've come in to overthrow him. Samson wakes up and he's like all bristled up. I'm going to jump bad like I have all these other times before. I'm going to whoop up on these Philistines. And he goes to shake himself and sadly doesn't realize that he played games one too many times and now he's on the losing end. That's a sad, sad reality. And so he shakes himself. The power's not there. He ends up having his eyes gouged out. You know, they did this uh, as a thing of sport in many ways, as a mockery. But they also did that the same way that if you read in history, in combat, many times they would cut off the thumbs or they would cut hands off. They would do different things to people that they thought were a threat to them when they had them in their captivity because that way, if they ever got loose, they couldn't be a threat later. So you imagine tonight, how in the world could Samson pose a great threat later on if he cannot even see his enemy? So they gouged his eyes out. And I want you to know that there's a lot to be said. I don't have time to get into that tonight. But let me tell you tonight, the enemy knows that if he can he can destroy your vision, you are not as combative and competitive in his eyes without a vision as you are with a vision. Like I said, I wish I had more time to talk about that because how many of you believe that where there is no vision, what the people perish? A lot of things I could say there, but again, I don't have time. So Samson's relationship with Delilah became one of betrayal. And one thing that few people talk about, I don't know if you've ever considered this, but the Spirit of the Lord reminded me this of this when I began to think and meditate on it. The few people talk about is how Samson might have been betrayed, but Samson himself betrayed his vow with God by revealing it to Delilah. Have you ever stopped and thought about that? We can feel sorry for Samson, poor old fellow. You know, he was, he was betrayed by Delilah. But in reality, Samson became a product of his own betrayal of the vow that he had between him and God. You might say, well, uh, the serpent betrayed Adam and Eve in the garden. But didn't Adam and Eve betray God in the garden as well? Before they were ever really, you know, officially betrayed themselves, they betrayed God. And so this is the life application and how it applies to us. Because the one thing that I don't ever want to do. I don't ever want to talk about these stories in a biblical context and not show you how they apply to us today and right now because a lot of times we read stuff in the Bible and people will come away and say, yeah, but Brother Myers, how does that apply to me right now? Well, I'm going to try and show you because if I had to guess tonight, there's doubtfully 
one single person that is listening here or maybe even online later that has never felt the pain of betrayal. If I had to guess, every single person in this room, whether in childhood, your teenage years, or at some point, has dealt with the pain of betrayal. And it goes without saying that betrayal is painful. The reason I believe that is, is because it robs relationships of trust. Relationships are built on trust. And it never seems to, uh, just ceases to amaze me that people in relationships who have suffered through betrayal, and then you get the other offending person that says, I don't understand. Why won't you give me a break? Why won't you trust me? Well, you, you are suffering through the struggle because you committed an offense in a relationship I would have never even had to cross that bridge of lack of trust if you hadn't broken that trust. That's not to say that the other person gets a free pass and they are never to show mercy because I believe we all should show mercy. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But how many of you understand that if someone has broken trust, they have to understand that trust has to be regained and sometimes that takes a while. Am I right, anybody? But it robs relationships of trust. It destroys unity. And it builds animosity. If there's any unity, it destroys it. And it builds, while it destroys unity, it builds animosity between people. You get relationships, whether it be church relationships, work relationships, ministry relationships, marriage relationships, dating relationships, parent and children relationships... Friendships, all relationships, I'm telling you that betrayal destroys that unity of the relationship and it builds an animosity between two people. You want to know, how is it? I mean, because it never, you know, it always baffles me. You get two people that you see them saying their vows to each other till death do us part and they're smiling at each other. They're smiling for the camera. They're taking a thousand pictures and they're posting them all over the world and Facebook and everything else. And they love each other and they think they're the greatest thing. They post their anniversary pictures. But as soon as they start going through a divorce, all of a sudden, you know, everybody's a devil. Everybody's, you know, all the secrets come out. All the hateful things come out. And isn't that sad to think that two people who once loved and admired and adored each other could cut each other's throat like that? Say amen, somebody. It's really sad. But it also leads some to vow that they will never get married again. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I said, I've been hurt so bad before. I've been betrayed. I will never get married again. You ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever heard or seen where somebody uh, is sitting in prison for the crime of murder? Because of betrayal. There are people right now that are sitting in a prison cell because of the crime of murder, which is a product of betrayal. There are people that were injured so deeply because of betrayal that they chose suicide as a way of escape from their pain. Because it hurts so bad to think that they were, am I, that's all I'm worth? You could just toss me to the side like that? I never meant anything to you? And they allow that pain to get so deep and they've been hurt so badly that they would actually consider and contemplate taking their own life. Someone say, that's not the answer. It's not the answer. answer. But betrayal, what is betrayal? Betrayal is an injury, but it's what I'm going to call tonight an unseen. Somebody say unseen. unseen. Let me talk to you about that for a moment. Unseen injuries are hard for other people to understand. Like, for example, let's just say that you're in a relationship and you're deeply betrayed by somebody in a marriage or a a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. And then later you get into another relationship with whoever. And that other person is struggling to understand you because you have an unseen injury in your life. It is a a lot like the unseen problems we may have on the inside of our body. How many of you understand what I mean when I say that if your leg is broke and people can see your leg is contorted or broke or you're in a cast, they have a lot, it's a lot easier for them to sympathize with you. Or if you got like a disc in your back that's bulging into your spinal cord and you're in a lot of pain and it's easier for people to say, oh, he's faking it. You know what I mean? 
because it's an unseen injury. It's an unseen problem. If you've got anxiety, they don't understand. People don't understand that a lot of times. Oh, you just need to suck it up, buttercup. Get over it. You don't know what I'm dealing with because I've got unseen injury. I'm saying that tonight because I want us as a people to realize that we serve a God who is compassionate. You agree? And how many of you in this room tonight who need the compassion of God? Listen, if you want God's compassion, you need to also have compassion on other people. You never know what somebody's dealing with. You never know what's going on in their heart or their mind. So it's only fair for you and I to have a level of compassion towards other people. If you agree, say amen to that. Because of these unseen injuries that, that uh, injure our trust and our respect. Is there anyone in this room before you ever had respect, a great deal of respect for a certain person in a certain position, but that was destroyed? You know, you look back at some of the things that some of us are familiar with in history. In the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I don't remember how far back, but there was a big controversy that arose within the Catholic Church. Anybody remember that? About the priest and a lot of the child molestation and such as that, which is a God-awful thing to even consider. And the damage that is done to a lot of these children throughout the years. I watched a documentary at one time. And to see these people as grown adults still in great tears over what they experience as children. And how it affects them later on in life. It's heartbreaking to think. But that is a form of betrayal that they dealt with. That is an unseen injury in their life. And it's, a, and it's something that causes people to lose respect and trust. I remember in that documentary that I watched, there was one man that his whole entire family, they were like fourth generation Catholics and everybody in his family was so devout. But he had completely strayed from any form of anything religious, anything to do with Christ, anything to do with God, Jehovah. He didn't want anything to do with all of that because he associated religion and faith with what betrayal he experienced from an individual. How many of you know there's a Judas in every crowd? And you can't let a Judas keep you from Jesus. Say amen. Amen. But this is an unseen wound that usually takes a long time to heal. And some people will even feel like it's never going to heal. There are some maybe that are sitting here tonight that you have experienced some sort of betrayal by somebody you love. And even to this day when the subject comes up, it really hurts deep. There's times that you may be sitting all by yourself and you start thinking about it and you feel a tear well up in your eye because it hurts you that much. And you think, was I that bad of a person to deserve that? For you to do me like that? Does anyone feel exactly what I'm saying? There's some people that really know what that feels because it's unseen. Few people can understand or identify with why you seem so bothered. Well, girl, that was 20 years ago. Why haven't you moved on? Well, I've been trying for 20 years. Maybe it's a scar that's very sensitive. Maybe I've healed some, but I've got a scar. Anybody got any sensitive scars? I've had times before that I've had any injury before, and the scar would come up, and even years later, if you touch the scar, it still hurts. It may not be the same, but it's still something that is hard to forget. I've wondered at times before that even though God allows us mercy, God helps us to have forgiveness to other people, that God doesn't allow us to have some form of sensitivity so it's a reminder of how good God is and how corrupt man can be and so that we ourselves won't be that kind of person to other people. If we've experienced that. Does anyone understand what I mean by that? I don't want to do anybody like I've been done. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times, statistically, people will do unto others as they were done as children. If, if their parents were abusive, sometimes they grow up to be abusive. You understand what I mean? So betrayal is real to all of us. And in real life, betrayal is like this. It's like the wife who founds out, finds out that her husband of 25 years has been secretly having a homosexual relationship and affairs with other men for nearly their entire marriage. I read a story, it's been about maybe uh, 10, 12 years ago, that I came across and I was just blown away by this story. This is really dedicated wife, they had children, they had what everybody would consider the American dream, they were successful, they had a home, they had a business, they had all these things, and she would have never in a million years guessed that her husband was homosexual. 
There was no signs that would have indicated to her that there was a problem in his life. But one day her husband went missing. You remember that story? I think we read it together or came across together. But her husband went missing. And this woman loved her husband so much that she contacted local newspapers, the news stations. I mean, she went all out. And she started working all on her own, taking care of the family, keeping the bills up, which was taxing her stressful. Uh, and, and at the same time, every waking moment she spent trying to find her husband. Until one day, after a couple of years went by, she received, received a letter in the mail. And it was her husband. He said, I just want you to know... Um, for all of these years, you know, I was a homosexual and I was going out and having affairs and this and that. And I have moved on with my life. I'm living with somebody. I didn't want anybody in my business. Please stop contacting all these radio stations and places and looking for me. I am fine and I'm okay and I don't want you to bother me anymore. Please move on with your life. And while you're at it, make sure you get checked for some STDs. Can you imagine the betrayal can you imagine that it felt like a wall fell on that woman as she got halfway through that letter can you imagine that's what real betrayal looks like and feels like in real life it's like the boss who finds out that they've got maybe one of their most trusted employees that work for the company and all of a sudden they find out after so many years that that trusted employee has been selling company trade secrets to their competitor what betrayal in real life, it's like the husband who finds out that his childhood best friend has been sexting his wife. And oh, by the way, these are all things that I, I know of. These are not just some made up kind of thing. It's kind of like helping someone who's in a really tough spot. Is anyone besides me, you don't like to see other people struggle? I hate to see other people struggle because I remind myself of the times I've struggled. The times that we had to buy a giant pack of that red tube hamburger and try to stretch it out make enough food last for five people all week long i know what it feels like and i don't like to see other people deal with that i know what it's like to try to figure out how i'm going to get to work and i got tires that could blow out or a car that's not running right i know what that feels like and i don't like to see other people go through that but if you're one of those kind of people then you'll understand what i mean but it's kind of like knowing that someone's in a really tough spot and so you help them out only later to find out that that same person, as they get better and life goes better for them, begins to trash your name to other people and say, yeah, when I was in need of help, they weren't there for me. That's betrayal. And that's what betrayal looks like. And that's sort of give you an idea of what betrayal might even feel like. For us to better understand the three things that I talked about earlier is to better understand betrayal, how to deal with it, better understand the pain it causes, and ensure, to ensure we don't become guilty of betrayal. I want you to consider some of the questions that I felt like the Lord laid on my heart, and also some of the things that I have personally been asked as a pastor. And I want you to know I have dealt with so many situations, scenarios, families, problems. I have myself had times that I thought I'd heard it all. And then someone would come with a question or a situation that would completely catch me off guard. And I'd have to say, well, you have to let me pray about that. Because I've seen people really get dealt some pretty hard blows in life. But consider some of these questions. The first question that I want to ask you tonight and want you to think about, is betrayal a sin? The reason that I wanted to talk about that is because we can talk about betrayal but if we don't realize whether it is a sin or not, we might just pass it off like, that's no big deal. You know, it's just a human emotion or a human attribute or it's part of life. We're all going to deal with it and just, you know, oh well, get over it. Is betrayal a sin? Well, in most all cases that I can think of, and I, I would say yes, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> betrayal is a violation and a breaking of trust. One of the core tenets to the Christian system of values is to be trustworthy, to be righteous, to be a friend to the friendless, father to the fatherless. It is to love your neighbor. Come on. You know what the scripture said? The first commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, soul, strength, and body. And the Bible tells us to love our neighbor, what? 
as our own self. And I can tell you, people love them, their self more than, than they may want to admit it. But it's a violation and a breaking of trust. It's a breach of Christian character and a lack of integrity which is counterintuitive to a few things and this is why i'm going to tell you it's a sin first of all because it is counterintuitive to honesty it is very opposite of honesty on top of that to faithfulness how can you be faithful to a friend how can you be faithful to the people who've entrusted you with maybe life or something they're going through how can you say that you love your brother as yourself if you betray the very people that he said love your brother as you love yourself how is that i believe that that is the reason that i'm telling you tonight i'm confident to say that betrayal can be a sin anyone feel what i'm saying tonight so i want you to see tonight that also one last thing about that personally i believe that god sees betrayal much the same way he sees sowing discord. I spent some time really meditating, musing on this idea. Think about sowing discord. That's one of the things that God hates. He hates discord. Sowing discord among brethren. That's feet quick to mischief and spread gossip and causing division and sowing discord among people. And do you know betrayal in a lot of ways is a lot like that. You are creating division. You are creating strife. You are creating mistrust and broken, uh, broken people, if you will. And it is a breach, like I said, of your character, responsibility. We say we're Christian, but what does Christian mean? Christ-like, like Christ. And so it's something that we need to consider. So if betrayal can be considered a sin... Let me ask you this question. Is there ever a time that betrayal is acceptable? I want you to listen to this because I don't want you to miss it. Is there ever a time that betrayal is acceptable? Before you answer that, I want you to hear me out. The only time that I can think of is when you must betray a trust that was placed in you for the sake of being honest or to protect the innocent. What I'm saying is, Let's just say, for example, your friend shared with you, hey man, you know, three or four years ago, I I raped somebody, I murdered somebody. And now all of a sudden it's come to a head and the police call you into the interrogation room and they're questioning you, hey, has your friend ever told you that he committed this crime? Is it betrayal? In some regard, you consider that betrayal because your friend trusted you with that information. But is it okay? I believe the answer is yes. And this is the reason why I'm telling you that, because at that point, it becomes a matter of betraying your own convictions and your commitment to God, not necessarily betraying the guilty, because this person is guilty. And so that is the only situation that as I prayed and sought the Lord, I can imagine that it would be fair to say, if you want to consider that betrayal, that it would be right to betray someone's trust. Because if they are guilty of something, they're guilty of it. Whether you keep it to yourself or you don't. Let me tell you something. If somebody came to you or somebody came to another person and said, Hey, I murdered this lady's son and I buried him back out in the woods over there in a popka behind the liquor store and, and it was your son, you would want the closure of whoever it was, the new, and you call it betrayal if you want to. I would want to know where my dead son was buried. You understand, I know that's probably a crazy example, but you get the point what I'm saying. So when is it acceptable? I'm telling you that is one of the only times I can uh, imagine that we could say maybe that it's acceptable. But one of the most common questions that I've been asked when someone has been betrayed. My wife and I have been asked this more times than I could ever imagine when someone's been betrayed. How do you forgive someone who's betrayed you? This is where the rubber meets the road. Because we say we're a Christian. We say we love God. We're trying to do right by God, by His Word, and all of this. How do you forgive someone who's betrayed you when you still feel the hurt, when you still feel the pain? Let's talk about that because I can first tell you that I fully understand because we 
ourselves have personally dealt with some of the greatest betrayal that I could ever imagine against us, our family, in ministry. And I can tell you, especially when it's someone that is really close to you. And especially when it's a person that has no remorse for what they've done and accepts no responsibility for their actions. You want to talk about hard to overcome uh, betrayal? Is when a person has no remorse about it. It's someone close to you. And they, they don't take no responsibility at all. That hurts really deep. And you'll go through all sorts of human emotions and you'll start running a gamut of things to your mind like, well, maybe I deserved it. Maybe I did this. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And maybe there are some truths to some things we can do better because we never want to not take responsibility where responsibility should be taken. But do you know that's just a path the enemy wants you to run down because he wants to have you blame everything on yourself when maybe someone else has failed to take that responsibility. Creates a lot of confusion. But I'm going to give you the answer to that question. At least this is the best answer as a pastor of all these years that I have been able to give other people. And I believe that in most all situations of how do I forgive someone that this applies. When someone has asked me that question, this is what I tell them. The easiest way to forgive someone who's done you wrong is to consider your own failures And in this situation, your own times of betrayal. Because let's be honest. People are quick to, you know, raise their eyebrows and raise their hand. Yeah, I was betrayed once. Somebody done me wrong. So and so back in 1968. I'll never forget how they did me. But we're not always quick to talk about the times that we betrayed someone else's trust. Because whether you want to admit it or not, whether it was in grade school and you told somebody else, hey, I'm just letting you know, Johnny told me he stole your matchbox truck. You know, at some point of your life, you have betrayed someone else's trust and may not have even realized it. I've had people tell me stories about stealing another person's, their best friend's boyfriend or girlfriend. You know, and they go on, get in a relationship and get married or whatever their story might end. I know people that have betrayed people and sometimes they don't realize it in the moment that is intentional or they don't realize the damage that they're causing. But almost everybody in some way has betrayed somebody. Maybe somebody shared something with you that was uh, secretive information. I told you this earlier. High school relationships and high school drama is a lot like this. That whenever friendships and relationships break up, all of a sudden, all the secret stuff you told me becomes ammunition when we get in an argument. That's not fair. That's not right. Can you say amen? You ever had someone tell something that you didn't want anybody to know? They smeared your name and they went on a smear campaign, if you will. That's not fair. But the easiest way to overcome that is to stop and think about all the times you have had to go to the cross And you've had to bow down and say, God, I messed up. Please forgive me. I'm not telling you that that will make it easy. I'm not telling you that it's going to go away right away. I'm not telling you that 10 years from now that the thoughts won't come to your mind from time to time. You're human. But the easiest way to forgive is for you to think about every time you have done God wrong or done anybody else wrong. Because it's a lot easier to have mercy on those, whether they do or don't deserve it, when you think about all the times you did or didn't deserve mercy from God. All the mistakes along the way, the times you've had to bury your head and say, Oh God, please forgive me for thus and so. It makes it a lot easier to forgive those who've done you wrong. Anyone understand, feel what I'm saying? A lot of y'all are kind of quiet tonight, so I know that it's sinking in. At least I feel like that. But you're not alone tonight. I don't want you to feel like for some reason or another that you're all by yourself. That it's just me and, you know, I deserve all that I'm gone through in life. And it's just because a product of whatever. You're not alone because Jesus himself could easily sympathize with where you're at. How's that? One of the most well-known stories of betrayal in the entire Bible. You know what it was? The Bible tells us that Jesus himself was betrayed by one of his very own disciples, Jesus. It is said that he betrayed him 
with a kiss. If you read Matthew 27 and 3, it says this, Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I hadn't long been saved, and I remember a preacher preaching this story, and he was right in the very crux of the message, and the anointing was in the atmosphere, and the conviction of the Holy Ghost, and I remember him definitively explaining what it might have looked like as if we were all in the room when Judas walked in among all of those chiefs and men and he took that bag full of 30 pieces of silver and threw it across the floor. I mean, you could hear the coins as they rolled across the floor of a man who realizes he has done the wrong thing. That just gives me chills thinking about it. Because he knows I messed up. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Isn't that a shame? The Son of the living God sold Him out for 30 pieces of silver. And when He realized He had done wrong, He he realized that was blood money. I don't even want that money. He walked back into that temple or whatever and threw it across the floor as if to say, I don't want it. You can have the money back. It's not worth that. And then later we realize that he goes out and he hangs himself. So, with that being said tonight, most all of you have had to deal with betrayal. And I want to encourage you tonight that if you have, or you are, or you're still kind of grappling with some of that pain, stop beating yourself over it. Because first of all, probably everybody in this room could say, yes, I know what you're feeling. I've been through some things before. But here's what I want you to remember. You've got a very merciful God. And He loves you enough that He understands. He's touched by the feeling of your infirmities. You can go to God and continually give that to Him and say, I need you to help me to have some peace over this. You don't have to weary yourself to death to the day you draw your last breath over something you cannot change. There are some things that have been done to you or things that other people have done to you. All the worrying in the world is not going to change it. I want to encourage you tonight to do your best like if you had a box with your problem in it and you took it to God and you set it down on the altar and said, here, take this. I want you to do that tonight. Whatever it might have been, somebody's done you wrong, it affects your relationship now with other people, it affects your ministry, it affects you whatever way in business. I want you to take that problem and I want you to set it on the altar of God tonight and ask God to give you some peace with it. I want you to stop beating yourself over it. And here's one other thing I'd like for you to consider. Knowing the pain that it caused other people and you, stop for a moment and realize every opportunity to betray somebody that comes along because the enemy works in the most divisive ways. When someone tells you, hey, Sister Marissa, me and my husband have been having problems in this area. Will you please pray for me? And then later on, you and uh, her husband may be in just a casual conversation. And yeah, your wife told me y'all are having problems. You know, really, that's a, that's a betrayal of trust that was entrusted in you. And that's not fair. If you don't like it, don't do it to other people. I'm telling you that there are people that God puts in your life who deserve integrity. They deserve for you to be upright, truthful, and have character that is representative of Christian character. If you agree with that, say amen. I'm going to give you an opportunity as we we come to a close tonight. And hopefully in some way this will help you, whether tonight or moving forward. But I'm going to give you an opportunity. I told you in the beginning of the message that there may be some people that will say, hey, you know what I've experienced some forms of betrayal, or maybe I've been guilty of betrayal and you'd like to share that with us tonight. Anybody?